grass-fed beef on this farm to fork wyoming survival in wyoming is earned by the hardy it's little wonder that cattle are king here at Lost Wells Cattle Company, just outside of Riverton, two brothers have returned cattle to the family operation. They focus on grass-fed beef, hoping to avoid some of the pitfalls of conventional cattle production today. We started doing everything <clears throat> wrong. And <clears throat> like Bobby said, we analyzed, we analyzed the markets, everything else, and when we began, um, our neighbors probably would have said, uh, you know, maybe you're a little crazy, um, but it's it's been working. We don't have we don't have corn. We don't need to feed corn. Uh, we uh, we put our cows on our grass pastures, and then we start looking at the health of the cow, which is a little tough to do because cows can't talk, <laughs> and so you kind of got to look at them and see how how they're looking today and and seeing what, what's right for the animal. As fourth generation ranchers, they had land they could lease and plenty of experience, but starting out on a shoestring led them to look at the industry with new eyes. You know, to get started with overcoming a lot of these other ideas, you, you have to be hard-headed almost to start in this industry because you have to really tune out um, what, what a conventional type program would do and say, you got to look at this from a cost standpoint first. You know, if you can't be profitable and sustainable, then how are you going how you, how you to last? You know, are you just going to borrow money just to go bankrupt in five years? Cultivating a local market was part of the strategy. We wanted something different. We wanted a, a consumer demand that didn't depend on what the price of cattle at the sale barn, you know, were. Um, and that's where we got into our direct marketing. You know, we need to be the primary educators in our business, not to try to get um, somebody else to sell our beef, but if we can sell it more directly, um, at least for the first few years, uh, to let people know exactly what they're getting or what they're not getting. What they get are cattle raised without growth hormones, grains, or antibiotics. And we like to tell people there's no really amount of regulation that can regulate integrity. Um, so we, we tell people, you know, if you really want to see where your state comes from, then get out here. You come out here and look around um, because, because our product is, is only as good as our word. So they've built a program based on good grass-fed cattle genetics and a belief that an organic-based system could be profitable. But really, industry has always pushed bigger, bigger cattle for performance. And the problem is that they perform well if you put grain in front of them. But who can afford any more to, to keep feed in front of cows all the time? A cow like this will wean a calf that's about the same size as those high, as, as those bigger cows. You know, 1,600 pound cows still only wean about a 600 pound calf. And that's what she weaned this fall, was right at a 600 pound calf and only weighing about 11 and a quarter, 1150. So very, very efficient. And you can see by her condition, she's just fat um, on nothing but hay and a little bit of mineral or pasture. We haven't fed any hay yet this year, and this is almost February now. Um, usually on an operation, it's, it's never an income problem. It's usually a spending problem, and that's where we try to, try to keep, uh, keep that in check a little bit. So they avoid some of the expensive conventional inputs and invest instead in a good mineral program. This is the mineral we, we mainly feed. We get this out of Nebraska and uh, take a little whiff of it. Nothing much to smell, but um, looks like dirt. Cows like it. What do you get from this stuff? Mainly iodine, but it's a, it's a high copper mix that uh, helps with during breeding season and um, a lot with calving too. Just helps keep the cows healthy. We ordered these up the other day. Those are actually um, flaxseed pellets. And flax oil is supposed to be good for, uh, for it shows in the hair coat, but then it shows in the, in the game. It really fattens um, calves on it. We combine this with this sack here. And this is a, this is a conditioner, they call it. It's, it's a clay. Volcanic, it's volcanic ash that overlays the salt beds, the sea salt beds, and it's loaded with trace minerals, but it's also a toxin binder, um, and it's great 
um, for cattle. Some problem is they don't always like to eat it, so we put the flaxseed pellets in it to, to make them eat more of it. Just, just flax put in the pellets and the oil's kind of pulled out of there, but there's a little bit of oil in there. The benefit is kind of the oil with, with flax, but um, but this is, is handy because it feeds well with the, with the conditioner too. So. And this is a, a baking soda. It's actually for human consumption, but it's a trace mineral baking soda. It's not the baking soda you get uh, here. It's out, it comes out of Rifle, Colorado. Yeah, it's an all-natural um, trace mineral baking soda for rumen digestion, rumen buffer. And for baking. <laughs> <laughs> this is one other thing we use, but this is diatomaceous earth. Um, like flour, really light. Gets all over you. <laughs> Makes you white. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, the di diatomaceous earth um, is good for internal and external parasites. Mm -hmm. It's because it's so fine and it's so sharp that it gets into uh, any type of fleas, flies, but any kind of insects, and it, it actually works its way into their body and kills them. Wow! Yikes! Yeah, like little Does tiny it, crystals. Do you have to be careful about breeding this stuff? No, actually, they recommend it for human consumption <laughs> as, a, as a fiber. Um, I don't know about the dust, though. Yeah, maybe maybe mm -hmm. you're right, but to put it in a glass of water, stir it up, and, and, and take it. And then we have the kind of the foundation of our mineral program, which is to trace mineral salt. This comes out of Redmond, Utah. It's a sea salt. Um, it's loaded mm -hmm. with, with trace minerals. So four years into their cattle company, They've built a sizable herd, and they still keep the overhead low. That's the idea. We don't want a tractor on this place if we can help it. We don't want to be able to have to use equipment. You know, the equipment, it's, <clears throat> it's nice, and, and if it's there, we'll sure use it. But um, it was made to break down. I, I don't know. It doesn't take long to look around and see that no matter how many trucks or tractors you have, it's not going to make you happy. <laughs> Even though they're fun, it's still not going to make you happy. <laughs> but. But to actually be able to see that, hey, you know, I don't need, you know, a $120,000 tractor to pull, you know, a plow around or to pull a feed wagon around. Um, we don't feed hay that often, you know. An old truck's going to work just fine, you know, for the couple months we have to feed hay, so. This kind of thinking led to some immediate payoffs. Starting with taking a marginal piece of land out of hay production and making it more productive through grazing. If we were to look at, uh, at this, this field over here, it's fairly uh, narrow and long. Uh, access into it's very difficult. Um, you had to bounce all the corrugates to the end to get into it, and the, and the ground wasn't very productive. When it fizzled out, you know, it was time to replant, time to plow. We asked my dad if we could graze it, and we figured out a, a cost of what he would need and we could do it. So we, we decided to go ahead and graze this part knowing that the, that the pasture ground wasn't very good. But, um, but we have found that uh, we, we've been able to get quite a bit more use out of this ground grazing it than we could have farming it. Even if we put it back in, plowed it under and put it back under peak production, we're still getting more use grazing it than we would, uh, would have farming it. So rather than cutting and baling the hay, now the cattle do all the harvesting. And there's some health benefits for the cow as well. Um, you know, anytime you can find animals, there's always disease. Mm. And when you can keep them out and keep them, you know, how, how they've run naturally, uh, I think we, our cattle are, cattle's immunity is very high because we don't confine them. Mm -hmm. um, because we let them, we let them roam out and, and we free choice a lot of minerals so they have the ability to, to choose what they need. And there's a measure for the productivity they're seeing. Joel Salatin is a, is a very intelligent guy when it, when it comes to uh, grazing and rotational grazing and intensive grazing. And he says you can improve your production substantially. And he takes, uh, I'll take a little piece of grass. He says grass grows in, in three phases like this. You have your, your infantile stage down here where it's just starting. You have your, just this part this the bottom it. part, the flat part. And then you have this stage in between, which they call adolescent stage. Mm -hmm. where it's really growing. Then you have a stage at top, which we call the senior stage, where it's topped out. Uh -huh. Well, it makes sense that you'd want to graze somewhere up in this top part. Mm -hmm. The problem is when you turn cows out on, on a pasture and you don't rotate it, they're always down here because they're keeping the grass short, so you're mm -hmm. never getting production. And so we're always trying to graze up here. And if we look at just some simple numbers on, on this place, 
Um, when we left this, if you figured the tonnage we made off this piece, how we left it, we were figuring we were getting about 100, 140 animal units per day if you left the pasture and took the hay. Where um, if you plowed it under and put it in peak production, you'd be getting around 240. Hmm. And now we're figuring, uh, grazing the way we are, we're getting about 300 animal units per day. They have doubled that pasture's harvest while avoiding the expenses of cutting, baling, fertilizing, and spraying. Now the cattle are doing all the harvesting while fertilizing. You just kind of get those sandy patches and bare patches, and now you've got the manure going on the ground. And well, the, the ground still is poor. We're in our third year of, of grazing this piece, and what we do see is that a lot of the grasses are crowding in and it looks more like a turf, but the alfalfa is still there. We haven't grazed the alfalfa out. The alfalfa is still there, but we're seeing a lot with grazing that the soils, you know, the cattle are, are really grinding in. They say a cow has five mouths, and he's got four feet and a mouth, so he, he walks over four times what he eats. Uh -huh. So he tramples in a lot of, uh, a lot of the food, and that, it, you know, people see that as waste, but that's really beneficial to the soils. It's really helping us to build our organic matter and to put a little cover over our soil. They point out that the key to these improvements is managing an intensive rotation of the herd, known as mob grazing. This approach to livestock management is getting a lot of attention these days for its ability to build topsoil and increase water retention. 30 days ago we were in on this pasture and we went down through and uh, we ended up, uh, we are ending up right over here today. 30 days later we, we do about three to four days in a about a two acre pasture um, and we have about 65 head and as we uh, as we go through the idea is to take half and leave half as you can see we've already come off this one and there's still quite a little bit of, of veg there and that helps a couple things it helps build our soil organics um, it also gives a little bit of shade to the ground so we don't have to water quite as much too Mm -hmm. um, and the hoof action really works to, to drive new seeds in and to, uh, and to and almost till till the ground. So mm -hmm. there, there's a lot of people who say you can't graze alfalfa because it won't come back. But it, it this pasture right here, it, we we're, we've been off it for 30 days, and it's coming back fairly good. And part of their approach allows the cattle to determine their own nutritional needs. Watch those cows and see what they eat, and it's not the same every day. You know, it just depends on where they are you know, in the temperature and the heat, you know, the time of day and where they are, their nutrition requirements, you know, it just depends on what they eat. So rather than trying to, to figure out what a cow needs and, and mix up a ration, you let her decide you know, and they'll figure it out every time. And they're seeing what? the kind of weight gains that rival the industrial feedlots without some of the associated problems and expenses. 11.79, nice. Nice. He's a, he's a fall calf too. That's pretty good for a fall calf. We, we do fairly well on gains. Um, we, haven't, we haven't lost a calf to bloat, and I think that's attributed to a mineral program that's complete and, and not based on commercial minerals, but um, trace minerals and naturally available minerals for our cattle. And they ate a quarter of a bag already in today's so just a few days, four days, five days or so. Yeah, if, they, if they need it, they get right after it. Well, in the mix. Yep, the mix with the, the pellets. Game. And then the diatomaceous earth, you can see the little, the lighter stuff on the side there. And that's the clay in the middle. And then the salt. Kind of dried up a little bit even. We should run them. Looks good for another week, until the weekend. But we're also seeing that, um, that our calves are gaining fairly well. Um, we're, we're getting between two and three pounds a day average on our calves, um, which you know feedlots are, are pushing for that you know two and a half to three. So we're getting just as good a gains as the feedlot is, but we don't have the expense. It's interesting how cattle health has helped soil health has helped our health, and to realize, <clears throat> first of all, I think the, the first truth for me was that um, a cow needs in the soil needs more than three nutrients, more than nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And a cow needs more than that too, and, uh, and see how they express themselves, and how a cow, how different diseases come out with with these these type of deficiencies, and to be able to cure these diseases in, in essence with the right mineral um, saves a lot of money and a lot of time and a lot of doctoring too. <laughs> so mm -hmm. if we can if we can solve a problem in the whole herd, 
with with uh, what's been expressed in one animal, then hopefully we're we're a little bit ahead of the ahead of the curve. And I think what we found that has helped the most is we've used uh, started supplementing with apple cider vinegar, mm. and um, it, it's got uh, many health benefits. But one of the one of the most beneficial is that it really stabilizes the rumen pH mm -hmm. in cattle, That's and we don't have bloat <laughs> problems. Avoiding toxins such as pesticides and Roundup has been helpful as they learn more about their impact on soil and the health of the herd. The cart's been put in front of the horse on a lot of these um, new chemicals they have that there hasn't been proper testing, there hasn't been proper vetting of these chemicals and, and who's providing the data in the initial runs. It's, it's not um, unbiased you know, um, institutions, it's the companies providing the product. I feel for a lot of people, I mean, even, even my dad was sold by chemical companies saying Roundup is totally safe. It's inert once it hits the soil. Well, more and more research is saying it's not. You know, it's an antibiotic, first of all, so it kills beneficial flora, not only in the soil, but also in the rumens of cattle. Well, how can you get a healthy cattle if they're on antibiotics all the time? Um, I th like Brennan says, more of propaganda is pushing a lot of producers in the wrong direction. Um, so it, it's more, it, it's not an us against them, it's more of really examining our roots and seeing what worked and why. Nature has an answer for everything. You know, are we, are we willing to wait is the problem. Everybody wants, you know, instant, now, today. Nobody wants to wait to see the results of what, what nature will take care of. Fertility and longevity are also signs that what they're doing is working. You know, I think when we finally started addressing our, our bulls, you know, raise our own bulls, you know, we're still, we're, we're working on that and, and we're getting there little by little, but find, find somebody who raised cattle without um, grain, because grain really affects, in bulls especially, it really affects reproduction, um, it affects how many cows a bull can cover, um, it, it affects um, performance, functionality, it affects their feet, their longevity, you know, most people, most commercial places only get four years, maybe five years out of a bull. Um, six is unheard of, and you know, we're looking at eight to ten. Mm -hmm. And most commercial operations only cover 25 cows with one bull. We're looking at 50 to 80, you know. And it's amazing, too, um, because these numbers would speak for themselves. If, you, if your cattle are healthy, you know, you, you get more production out of them all around. But I think that that's really been um, a big issue is when we addressed our fertility and our bulls then we, we haven't had open cows. And, and we run older cows. People say, well, if you run young cows, you won't have opens. We run old. We run our cows up to 14, 15 years old. Matt cows out of a 14-year-old cow. Her mom went, made it till 14, and that cow's mom made it till 15. So there's, there's longevity built into these cows, too. You know, you, you keep them that long and, and run them that long. Um, you know a little bit about their genetics, too. And this is, this is our, our patriarch, her matriarch cow, I guess you would call her. And, I think she's seven or eight now, and she's kind of the foundation of the genetics we're, we're trying to achieve in, in our herd, very moderate, um, like a four and a half frame, 1300 pound cow, really thick, always fat, always raises a good calf. And so far, along with improved soils, they've seen good pest resistance on the 20 acre tract. In, in the fall, the bricks levels get really low, and that's when you see a lot of the, the bugs, and Brennan said they have a purpose, they come in and, and they, they process the excess material down into a carp and you know to recycle it into the into the ground. But if during the season, if you keep your your plants healthy, your bricks levels are high. And that resists you know most most uh, bug infestations, but also keeps a lot of the weeds out too. Mm -hmm. so. so the bugs are really kind of designed their digestion is designed to eat the lower energy plant exactly. leftovers. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, they serve a great purpose. You know, they're, they're great recyclers, but if you're getting them in when you're supposedly supposed to be producing hay, then, then something's wrong with your crop. If, um, if we can just keep the plant healthy, I think mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the way we want to go. Both of us being engineers, uh, we can definitely micromanage, but it's kind of nice to <laughs> sit out there and look around and say, you know, I didn't do any of this. I asked their dad what he thought about his son's break from the conventional approach to cattle production. You know, experience is a, is a wonderful thing, but experience is obsolete. All my experience from 30 years ago means almost nothing now today in what they're doing. They're the first generation to do this marketing beef. 
my wife and I are the first generation to bring real production into into the uh, cattle business. Generation before that was about expanding the the operation to make it sustainable. And then the first generation started agriculture was about starting. But each one was the first generation. Each one had their important part to do and, and to carry on. But it's always the one generation that is doing it is the one that counts. In Lander, I found a chef with a passion for local foods. He cures beef breziola for his customers at the Middle Fork and gets his meat from the same butcher the Tolmans use, Wyoming Custom Meats in Hudson. There's kind of a renaissance happening with this curing of meats and more artisanal things. It really, the interest really comes from, I don't know, finding the root of a product, understanding how fresh pork belly becomes bacon or how an eye of round becomes breziola. I find that fascinating. So I really like the hands-on style of cooking. So this particular method technique comes from Lombardy region of northern Italy. Just think about the old ways of cooking, which is you use every part of the animal because you don't know when you're going to get that opportunity again. Uh, this makes perfect sense to take the cut of meat that's tougher and to cure it, to dry it out, which kind of prolongs its life and gives you food where there's no refrigeration, which is really the driving force behind this. There's no refrigeration, so mm -hmm. hence lots of salt to take care of bacterial issues and then air drying as a preservative. So when you're trimming the meat, you want to basically have a clean muscle, which means all of the silver skin needs to come off. If you were to leave the silver skin on there as it dries, the silver skin would contract and slowly bend it into a shape. This is the beef eye round, which comes from the hind quarter of the animal. It's used for this because of its uniformity and because it's got a lower fat. If there's more fat in it, you've got fat that can go rancid on you. So what you want is something that has less marbling in it. It's also a tougher cut of meat, so probably historically better for curing rather than cooking after it's been marinated and then hung to dry um, and then sliced really thin you'd never even know ready to break it in half so that will be um, two brasiola so the biggest concern with this is we want to prevent bacterial growth um, because it hangs out at room temperature, it slowly dries. So it's, it's just a big piece of protein and that's what bacteria really want. A nice temperature and, and food for growth. So the way that we deal with that is uh, through salt, which raises the pH and creates an inhospitable climate for the bacteria to grow. Uh, and then we boost that a little bit with, uh, with this pink salt. Instacure number two which is uh, sodium nitrate. Sodium nitrate penetrates the muscle, which then creates that inhospitable climate for the bacteria. Is it killing all bacteria or are ba some bacteria is part of the No, cure? some bacteria is, is good. And, and as it hangs, you'll notice on the outside that it gets kind of a white um, coating. It adds to the finished product the sodium nitrate salt, there's kosher salt, brown sugar. Um, it could be granulated sugar, but brown sugar just has a little bit more flavor, a little bit more depth to it. Fresh ground black pepper, uh, red pepper flakes, some crushed juniper berries. We want uniformity in the, uh, in the dry marinade mixture, so that's why we grind everything into a finer powder. chopped thyme and rosemary, and then some fresh chopped garlic, and then a large Ziploc is really nice. It doesn't have to be. Any sort of non-reactive mm. container is, is going to work just, just fine. Now we take roughly half of the marinade and apply it. You do the best that you can. 
make sure that the ends are covered. Then we'll pour what remains on the pan into the bag and kind of massage it before we refrigerate it. So that is not quite the finished product. This goes under refrigeration for seven days. And uh, every day or two, you just want to turn it over. Uh, that salt is going to be pulling moisture out of the meat. Mm -hmm. And if you don't turn it, then the bottom half, which is kind of soaking in this marinade, will cure more than the top half. So it just needs to be rotated. Mm -hmm. um, at the end of seven days, then you take it out, apply the other half of your marinade to it, and then put it back in the bag and refrigerate. Okay. So at the end of two weeks, uh, the curing process is done, and then it's a matter of drying. You have more control over your product when you are building it from the ground up rather than buying it from somebody else. Everything that we bring in, we bring in raw, and it somebody, at least one person along the way, touches it with their hands in order to prepare it to go onto a plate. That's well, one of the things that I love about cooking is now I'm getting to a point where you might just be able to perceive my personality in the food, maybe. But mm -hmm. I eat it all the time, so I can't say for sure. <laughs>